Sounds good. All right. Well, welcome y'all. Thank you so much for uh, for coming. Um, so I'll uh, I'll introduce myself now as well. Uh, so my name is Aaron Gustafson. Um, I'm sort of known for a variety of things over over the many years that I've been working on the web. Um, probably one of the most important things was running the Web Standards Project for a number of years. Um, I've been at Microsoft for about six years right now, working on web standards, working on accessibility. Um, a big chunk of my day is spent thinking a lot about progressive web apps, but I've been very involved in the progressive enhancement space for a very long time, um, starting out when I was uh, kind of first getting into, like really into JavaScript in around 2003, all the way through uh, today. And so, um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about JavaScript stuff, but I'm gonna be talking a lot about uh, a bunch of other things as well um, and sharing a, a a few stories along the way. Um, all right, so without further ado. Um, so I've been working on the web since about 96. And um, if I've lear learned one thing in that time, it's this, you know, accessing the internet's no longer, a no longer a luxury. This is how we participate in the modern world, right? And this isn't a new thing. Folks have been preaching the importance of the internet since the early aughts at the, the very least. Um, so this is a statement from the World Summit and Information uh, Society, uh, which was from 2003. And even the UN's Human Rights Council weighed in on the importance of the internet in 2011, uh, talking about how important it was for uh, human rights, combating inequality and accelerating development of, and human progress. But even with all these lofty words, that hasn't really become a reality. Um, sadly, we've yet to deliver on the promise of the internet in an equitable fashion. And nations and corporations aren't the only ones who bear responsibility here. We need to recognize the part that we play in creating and maintaining this inequitable system. So where are we going wrong? So first of all, let's start with accessibility as a lot of folks are reckoning with that right now, or at least they should be. So. Um, when I originally wrote this talk in 2020, um, I was reflecting on the WebAIM's uh, million uh, pages uh, study, which they do every year. And in the 2020 study, they found that 98.1% of home pages had some sort of detectable WCAG2 violation or failure. Um, and this study evaluated the accessibility of home pages in the top million websites and over 100,000 additional interior site pages as well. Um, this was actually up from 97.8% in February of 2019. Now, the numbers actually just came out from this study for 2021. Um, slight improvement, now only 97.4% of home pages had detectable WCAG2 failures. Um, so, tiny, tiny improvement from the 98.1% in 2020. Um, the most common um, Places that we have problems have to do with things like low contrast, missing alternative text, having empty links or missing form labels. Um, but it doesn't have to be this way. We actually create disability when we fail to consider the range of human experience and capability. In a culture without paved roads, um, wheelchairs and wheelchair accessible buildings, being unable to walk would mean being unable to go out in public, which is a very severe impediment. But in a culture with those technologies, being unable to walk is much less impairing. So the severity of a person's disability is entirely dependent on the accessibility of their environment. When we design for people who are like us, so the, you know, the, the gray side in this is, is the, where the designer fits in or the developer. I've used the term designer broadly because we design a lot of systems. Um, but when we design pe for people who look like us, we end up excluding anyone who isn't like us. So our own biases create divisions between the folks who are like us and the folks who are different from us. This is something that's highlighted very well in the uh, Microsoft Inclusive Design Principles. Um, and that's where that, that last illustration was from as well. When we center on the experience of the most vulnerable, it actually has ripple effects for similarly disabled people along a continuum from permanent disabilities to situational ones. And when we don't, we exclude huge numbers of people. So in this particular example, um, I'm gonna use US stats. 
uh, since that's where I'm based. But if we, if we think of the continuum of disability from a permanent disability of losing an upper extremity through arm injury, which temporarily uh, disables you uh, in being able to use that, that limb to being a new parent where you have to hold a child, this actually accounts, oops, sorry, this actually accounts for over 20 million people annually in the US. Okay, even though uh, the number of people who only have uh, loss of an upper extremity, I think is somewhere around 13,000 people who, who lose the use of an upper extremity permanently um, in the US every year. So that may seem like a very small number, but when we extrapolate it out to from permanent to, to temporary to situational, um, we actually have huge, huge ripples out to 20 million people. Um, so where are we going wrong? Well, we're failing clearly when it comes to accessibility, right? But, but that's not it. Um, exclusion uh, extends beyond the world of disabilities too, creating what's referred to as the digital divide. So there are three aspects of this that I wanna tuck into here. The first of which is access. So access has to do with, you know, are internet services even available? How are they delivered? Are they hardwire? Are they mobile network? Are they satellite? Are they being sent over microwave? Which I actually have a, a colleague who gets his, his internet via microwave, which is pretty wild. Um, what's the speed? What's the latency they're dealing with? Do they have data caps? How affordable is the internet if they do even have access to it? What's the monthly cost? If there are data caps, caps what are the overage penalties? And another thing we need to keep in mind is that the idea of affordability is something that needs to be viewed as a percentage of someone's income, not some isolated number, because it varies from person to person and it varies from uh, locale to locale. So the second thing to consider in terms of the digital divide is technology. So does someone have access to a device that can actually use the internet? Um, if it's their personal or family device, uh, or is it their personal or family device, in which case it may be shared, um, or do they use a library or have some sort of school provided device where they don't really have a whole lot of control over how they're accessing the internet? Um, what are the specs on those devices? Is it functioning properly? These are other things that we need to consider. Um, this is another one that I, I need to find the, the latest stats because they, they had not been released when I originally wrote this talk. Um, but if we look at smartphone penetration in the US, uh, this, is, this is the findings that the Pew Research Center found. Um, so when you break down the percentages, as you would expect, as you move through different um, income uh, kind of stops on the income ladder from sub $30,000 a year through 50, 30 to 50K, 50 to 75K and over 75K, you end up with a greater and greater percentage of smartphone usage in those homes. Um, you know, as you would expect, as you have more disposable income, you have more smartphones in use, um, as opposed to a very, very tiny wedge of um, feature phones as we move up and up. Um, so what's interesting in the 2019 data versus the 2018 data um, is that the smartphone penetration in the 50,000 and up brackets, so those last two uh, increased, um, but in the 30 to 50K, it actually went down from their uh, 2018 numbers. Now, lest this be deceiving where we, you know, kind of looking at this in these, these four groups, we kind of think, okay, you know, there's, there's pretty significant smartphone penetration, um, but roughly half the U.S. population actually falls into that 30,000 and under bracket. So that's something really important to remember. This is not all things being equal, right? The, that one quarter of this particular visualization uh, is actually much, much larger than the other three. Um, if we actually break this down by location, you can also see that the more urban or suburban um, a population is the, the higher the likelihood that there's going to be a smartphone there, whereas in more rural areas, we're going to see more feature phone usage. Um, it's also important to um, note that one in five U.S. adults is a smartphone-only internet user. That means they uh, likely have no broadband access at home or in the house that they rent or the, the place that they're living. Um, and the breakdown of this data from Pew actually shows that this is more prevalent among folks who are poorer, younger, and not white. Um, and the share of lower income U.S. adults who are smartphone only has actually doubled uh, since 2013. 
Now, one last bit from an earlier Pew Research study that I want to share with you that I think is particularly interesting is that in their 2017 version of this survey, smartphone users who were making $30,000 a year experienced app errors more than half the time. Now, there's a lot to unpack there. So I want to, want to take a moment and pause on this because we're dealing only with smartphone users, right? But these people happen to be in a lower income bracket, so sub $30,000 a year. Now, they're experiencing app errors on their smartphones more than half the time. So if we start to kind of think about what is the reason that that could be happening, well, it's internet connectivity issues. It's different specs than what we've been designing and developing on. Um, you know, it's intermittent connectivity. Um, it's a variety of things that could be contributing uh, to what the experience is for them. We, many of us at least, um, I don't, don't know all of you personally, but uh, many of us live in a world of shiny black rectangles that are running the latest OS on really fast chipsets that are connected to the internet over really high speed networks. Right? That's, that's the, real, the sort of fantasy world that we all live in. It's our reality, but in terms of the global population, it's very much a fantasy. The reality for much of the world is vastly different. They're using all sorts of different devices. Um, I have somebody that I know that, that when they travel, they actually take their Kindle 3 with them because it has the WhisperNet provided by Amazon, which gives you free access to the internet globally um, over 3G. So it's you know kind of a slow connection, but he can reliably get access to the web and there is a web browser on it. Um, he can reliably get access to the web uh, around the globe and not have to pay exorbitant amounts uh, when he's traveling, which is pretty wild. And then of course, there are all sorts of, of different devices um, at, at different specs and, and price points. So, if we fail to center the lived, lived experiences of people who are different than us, then we're actively excluding them from using our products and services. We limit their ability to access critical information and we undermine the very premise of the internet as this great equalizer. So the third aspect of the digital divide that I wanna talk about is digital literacy. And what this has to do with is uh, asking questions like, does this person know how to use the device that they have? Do they understand how to interact with the software that they use to run it or configure it? Do they understand how to use the internet? Do they know how to spot dangers like phishing attacks? Do they know how to protect their privacy? Um, and kind of related to this, uh, there's a topic that I wanna to touch on briefly, which is, is called digital redlining. So this is any act of creating or perpetuating, perpetuating inequities between already marginalized groups through the use of digital technologies, digital content, and the internet. So digital redlining is an extension of, of the practice of redlining and housing discrimination that some of you might be familiar with uh, from kind of the, the history in, in the US. Some examples of digital redlining include things like AT&T discriminating against low-income neighborhoods in terms of the internet speed that it offers, or Facebook's ad platform enabling discrimination in housing and financial services advertisements uh, based on, on uh, people's ethnic backgrounds. Um, companies using Facebook to create an opaque and unregulated kind of credit score that acts as a gate for opportunities to um, financial betterment and such. All the way down to like Pokemon Go not having gyms and poker spots in low income and minority neighborhoods or Amazon Prime members uh, in predominantly poor, poor and black neighborhoods that can't get the same day treatment that their neighbors in uh, neighboring white communities can get. Um, so there are lots of things that can come together to, to be digital redlining. So where are we going wrong? As I mentioned, we're failing when it comes to accessibility, and then we're failing when it comes to managing access or lack thereof to the internet. We're also failing when it comes to supporting broad categories of devices, and we're failing when it comes to recognizing that we are not our customers. That's kind of the ultimate place that we're going wrong. We are not our customers and we need to recognize that. Now, when we think about inequity, that in and of itself is not an awesome thing, right? But when we are in a crisis, that actually compounds these inequities and makes them even worse. So I'm gonna give you a, a quick story from one of my colleagues. Um, so she works at Microsoft too. You know, she, she has a, a very good income. Um, lives in a, a nice neighborhood, um, 
And she actually had a winter storm hit her neighborhood here in Washington state. And um, when the winter storm hit, it actually blew over power lines and stuff like that. And that caused electrical fires. And there were trees that were blocking uh, the street because they had fallen. They were blocking two of the three exits out of her neighborhood. Um, and all of this was happening about 30 miles from downtown Seattle in a relatively affluent area. Um, where there were few visible indicators of any sort of digital divide. And yet, in that situation, in that, you know, you know not horrible crisis, but crisis nonetheless, I mean, electrical fires and the inability uh, to quickly escape the neighborhood where there was, where there, where there was damage and risk, um, she was having issues using her mobile uh, browser and using the site to actually um, report issues and find out about what was going on and, and finding out about her safety in that area. Um, and she finally managed to get the, the uh, page to load to report the outage after about five minutes, which is not awesome at all, right? And, and that was a relatively um, minor incident. Now consider something much more horrible the devastation of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico in 2017. Now, Puerto Rico's internet services were not great to begin with, so the impact was massive. It's estimated that between 800 and 8,500 people lost their lives due to, the, due to the damage and the lack of basic services, including telecommunications, in the weeks and the months following Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria downed 1,360 of Puerto Rico's 1,600 cell phone towers and about 85% of their above ground telephone and internet cables. And not all of the death and destruction obviously happened because telecommunications went down, but a lot of it was compounded because people did not have the ability to get help when they needed help. And that created an even worse tragedy. And weather isn't the only kind of crisis that compounds these systemic problems. So consider our current reality. Um, I want to take a, a moment and focus on education because I feel it provides uh, some much needed perspective. So internet access is very unequally distributed, and yet many children are being asked or required to learn from home until it's safe to return to their schools. And without software that can work well in limited or no connectivity scenarios, um, children are even more likely to fall behind their, uh, poor children are or more than likely to fall behind counterparts in wealthier and more densely populated areas. So if, if there are children who are, are in rural areas um, or who don't have uh, the funds to pay for, for reliable, fast internet, um, they're more likely to fall behind when it comes to educational opportunities. Um, so this example is, is from uh, Southeast Asia, from Kuala Lumpur. Um, but this isn't a phenomenon just limited to non-Western nations either. So I have an example here in Phoenix, there were three high school students who were found huddled under a blanket outside a closed elementary school. Um, and the reason they were there is because they didn't have internet access at home. And so they came to access the school's Wi-Fi in order to be able to do their homework. Connectivity aside, um, dig digital literacy is not universal either. So countries participating in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which are considered developed countries uh, with a high income economy, um, they don't have digital literacy solved either. Um, so here we see that you know, the OECD average percentage of computer literate people hovers around 25%. So a quarter of the population will have uh, or rather computer illiteracy hovers around 25%. So a quarter of the population will have major trouble in accessing e-learning uh, as an educational method. So how do we provide an equitable, an equitable education to the children who are among the 25% considered digitally illiterate in those countries? What about in other countries with even lower digital literacy rates? And even if a student has everything going for them, they live in the quote unquote right place, they have the quote unquote right device and they have the skills to use it, what happens when the shift in internet traffic rapidly diminishes their connection to school, which has happened since the pandemic? Um, if we look at the pressure being put on the internet globally, we can see a huge effect in countries with high COVID-19 infection rates. And then of course, no surprise here, there have been numerous studies of e-learning software that have found um, that accessibility is a major problem in this area. So 
if we think about what it is that, that we build and we think that what we're building is important, we really need to treat it that way. We need to recognize that crises are inevitable, but we can rise to meet that moment. So we do this by planning for network issues, empowering our customers, our neighbors, and constituents. We eliminate waste whenever possible and reduce complexity. So let's start by looking at networking specifically. So let's plan for network issues. And we can do that by relying on small static files, making as few requests as humanly possible, uh, leveraging browser defaults, and using a service worker. So I'll step through each of these one by one, starting with uh, smaller files. Now, this is not a revelation by any means. Smaller files with less processing overhead are faster, right? It's worth reminding ourselves that, though. Um, small static files, they download more quickly, uh, no matter what the HTTP version is that you're, you're sending them over. They cost our users less to download. They take up less space on our users' devices. Um, they cost us less to host and deliver. Um, and they put less stress on our servers and our infrastructures, meaning we're able to serve more users, and that your server is less likely to crumble when it's under heavy stress. Um, and the content, when it's small and static, can be moved to edge servers and CDNs more easily as well. Now, I'm going to focus on the smaller files right now and circle back to the, the static bit in another section. Now, interestingly, this is something that CNN considered during another crisis in our past. So in 2017, when Irma was bearing down on the Caribbean and Florida, CNN launched a text-only version of their website at light.cnn.io. Um, and here's what that looked like. It was stripped down to focus on only the essentials, and it required much less bandwidth to download. But text-only sites weren't really new in 2017, right? NPR built a text site originally as thin.npr.org in 2005 based on lessons that they learned during the attacks on September 11, 2001. But text-only sites have existed since the beginning of the web, and they still make a ton of sense, especially if you need to deliver critical information to folks in the middle of an emergency. And it's not just news sites that benefit from this approach. The National Hurricane Center also has a text-only site. So I want to do a quick comparison here um, between the um, quote-unquote normal site and the light, light site here for that, uh, that National Weather Service. So the normal site clocks in at 679 KB, makes 57 requests, starts rendering in just under three seconds. Um, the uncanny valley of not being able to interact with the site um, but it being rendered is um, 0.2 seconds. It's fully loaded in a little over eight seconds and it costs about seven cents to download. Um, the text only version in contrast only weighs 39 kilobytes, 17% or 17 times smaller. Um, it only makes seven requests. It renders, uh, it starts running at 2.3 seconds. Um, it only has an uncanny valley for 0.1 seconds, fully loaded in 6.2 seconds, so it renders uh, 1.3 1, times faster, and it costs virtually nothing to download. It works on every device. Um, and so what you see here is that they took a pretty decently performing site and they improved it significantly. Um, and they made eight times fewer requests, uh, which leads me to the point about fewer requests leading to a faster and more resilient experience. So fewer requests mean less blocking and less likelihood that a request will fail. And even though HTTP2 delivers files in a single stream, um, even the users who are on HTTP2 will also benefit from fewer requests being made. Another benefit to everyone is sticking with browser defaults. So you know, there's, there is this push, and it's been a consistent push for as long as I can remember, um, to JavaScript all the things. So it's, it's entirely possible to build custom controls um, and you know, use CSS to try and override browser defaults and stuff like that. But we should try to avoid that whenever possible. Browsers provide a ton of default styles and form controls and such that are highly usable and heavily vetted for accessibility and such. And whenever you replace a native browser feature with your own bespoke code, you're increasing the cost to your users, you're increasing the fragility of your site, and you're slowing down the performance. 
It also means you have to maintain that code over the lifetime of the site. I'll talk a little bit about uh, this in relation to dependencies a little bit more in depth shortly. Um, so we need to look at everything through a lens of whether that trade-off is worth it. Um, so using things like browser default styles, browser controls, browser interactions, and default fonts as much as possible. Now, one area where you can improve on the browser's default approach using JavaScript is in the networking world. Um, so we can use a service worker to tune the performance of our sites far better than any browser can on its own because we know more about our content and how our site is put together. So a service worker, if you're unfamiliar, it is a web worker. It's a very specific kind of web worker. It runs in its own thread, it runs in the background, and it kind of sits between your users and the network. So to illustrate that, here we have kind of the, the traditional connection from your user to your server and back, obviously a lot of hops and skips and jumps in there. Um, but what's different about using a service worker is it actually sits in the middle. Um, and so you make a request to, uh, or, or your user rather, makes a request to the service worker and that service worker can check in its own cache and look to see if it has a response in that cache that it could reply with. And it never even goes out to the network. It just plucks that out of the cache and responds with it. If however, the user requests a file and the service worker does not have access to it in the cache, it can request it from the server and then tuck a copy in the cache um, and respond with the, uh, the copy that it got from the server. So this leads to much, much better experiences overall. Um, service Worker can do a ton of really interesting things, uh, just a few of which I'll enumerate here. So you can use them to create an offline page. Uh, so maybe the text-only version of, of your page as an offline page. You can provide stale content while you look for new content. I've seen this done really well in a weather app where it shows the last details that it had grayed out before it loads in the fresh data. Um, you can provide alternate content in order to save bandwidth. So um, an example that I use for this is being able to swap out images on the fly so that uh, if somebody has data saver mode turned on on their browser, for instance, I could put in gray box SVGs in place of images and actually say like this image wasn't loaded because you've got data saver turned on. Those sorts of things can wholly be done within the service worker and don't require going out to the server at all. Um, oops. So, and we'll, we'll talk about that last one, the, the providing alternate content. I'll, I'll tuck into that in a bit more detail. So when it comes to giving our critical information services, the best chance of re reaching our users, we should rely on small static files, make as few requests as we can leverage defaults in the browser and employ a service worker whenever possible. The next step is to ensure our content is accessible to the broadest possible audience. We do that by writing clearly and concisely, making accessible markup choices, ensuring our designs are flexible and can adapt to different circumstances and do whatever we can to make sure that JavaScript doesn't get in the way of having an accessible experience. So when people are in crisis, their personal compute power is reduced. A 2015 study found that in stressful situations, people's ability to accurately recall information that they read was, in, was affected. Um, this was compounded if getting key information required any sort of inference, and the effect was even more pronounced for folks who were reading text that wasn't in their native language, even if they read and understood the language that the, the text was presented in. So there's an awesome book called Nicely Said from Nicole Ken uh, Fenton and Kate Kiefer Lee that offers suggestions of how to write with the reader in mind. So they recommend being clear, being concise, being honest in what it is that you're saying, being considerate of the person who's reading the text and writing how you speak. And I'm gonna add one to this, which is to avoid technical and legal jar jargon to the extent possible. We shouldn't be making assumptions about our audience's domain knowledge and we should avoid using unnecessarily technical uh, or jargony terms. If you do need to use them, just make sure that you're defining them when they're first introduced. Now, beyond thinking about the words that we use, we should be thinking about the markup choices that we're using to support those words. So I'm gonna give a quick example. Um, here's some markup for a blog post, right? So progressive web apps in the Windows ecosystem. We have a bunch of divs here. This is the same sort of thing that you might see uh, anywhere on the web. Everything's a div. There's a couple B elements in there. Um, and when we look at this, all of these divs 
are totally meaningless. They may have, you know, what we might consider semantic class names or something like that, but they don't tell us anything about the content that they're uh, encapsulating. There are a ton of solid markup uh, choices for us to use in our writing from paragraphs to different list types to figures and figure captions. Um, and there, we even have a handful of excellent elements that can help us explain how the overall interface is organized as well. And there are a ton of benefits to using semantic markup, not the least of which is getting browser supplied freebies like readability. So if we look at these, these two examples, the one on the left-hand side shows the div version where the divs are only creating block uh, divisions between, so starting a new line for each of the, the divided content, um, which is somewhat helpful. But if we compare that to a semantic version of the document where we're using things like headings and definition lists, um, and paragraphs, the one on the right is far more readable because it's got space, it's got indentation, um, it's using proportion to, to denote what is more important, what's less important, etc. cetera. Um, and if we want to assert, assist users in traversing page, pages easily, we should also be using assistive tech and add landmarks to the page. Some of these landmarks we actually get for free. So the role of banner, for instance, gets automatically applied to the first header element that is not inside of a sectioning element. Um, then we have role of navigation, which is automatically mapped to nav. We have the role of main, which is automatically mapped to the main element, complementary to a side. And then content info gets applied to the first footer element that's not inside of a sectioning element as well. The only one of these really useful landmarks that's not uh, automatically uh, inferable from a semantic um, element choice is the role of search, which you'd use to encapsulate your search form. Um, so considering the markup that we choose goes a long way towards making our projects accessible to the broadest number of users. And once we have that, we just need to make sure that we don't undermine that value by making poor choices in our CSS or our JavaScript. Um, so when it comes to building for the web, we need to keep in mind that the products and services we create are for others. Again, not for ourselves. We are not our customers. We need to ensure that um, our customers can adapt our designs to their requirements. And probably the, the most uh, commonly understood way of, of doing this you know, fairly recently, at least from the last decade, is responsive design. That's what responsive design was all about, was making sure that our visual designs could adapt to a variety of screen sizes. Um, and before that, there was the DAO of web design in which John Alsop was talking uh, about how important it was uh, that our designs adapt and flex to meet our customers' needs. So one way to do this, uh, one way to adapt is to keep the font size flexible by using things like M's and more recently REMS. Um, you know, that's been a best practice for a while, but a lot of folks are still using pixels for their media queries. So one thing I love about using M's for media queries is that actually if users bump up the font size on their desktop or their tablet, for instance, the design will actually switch to being more appropriate to the reading aid scale. So it, you know, if they're on a tablet, it might go from being you know, more of like a 10,000 foot view of the website to now all of a sudden they're in like a mobile reading experience where it's a single column, which is pretty awesome um, just with them bumping up the font size, which is, is very, very helpful. Um, Another way to do this is to avoid relying just on color to convey important information. So if somebody has, uh, in this case, uh, deuteranopia, uh, which is red green color blindness, the red and green buttons at the top there uh, for confirm and cancel actually look like those two kind of mustardy, olivey green um, colored buttons below, um, which is problematic. If we just added something like some iconography along with that, it can help people quickly grasp the purpose of these buttons um, and not have to rely on color specifically. It's also exceptionally important uh, to folks uh, that we ensure pop proper contrast. So we think about this with people who have vision disabilities, certainly, um, but it's also really important for people who might be outside and maybe have to turn down their screen brightness in order to save battery on their mobile device. So again, the ripples get broader and broader, even if we might be thinking about this in a, a specific uh, accessibility scenario. And then using a me media query, uh, even something as simple as only screen in the media attribute of a link tag will actually make older browsers ignore media query 
uh, or, or ignore that file if they don't support media queries, which is kind of cool. So we can use a um, you know, variety of, of uh, capabilities to bake in better performance. So selectively delivering advanced styles uh, using media queries. We can isolate large CSS images within min width media queries. So when we use min width, um, it ensures that any browsers uh, that are rendering outside of that minimum width will not download that image, which is super helpful. Whereas if you use max width where you're shrinking the design, it will download all images that would, would potentially apply. Um, so you end up with, with negative performance impacts there. Um, please, please, please don't ever hide images using CSS. When we use CSS to hide images, we're, we're still charging people for that image, even if it's not being displayed. It's almost like this hidden tax on our users. Um, and it can have a, a profoundly negative performance impact because the image is still being downloaded, even if it's not being displayed. Um, responsive images are an awesome way to go. Um, we have some discussion about changing the behavior to uh, make certain images uh, actually hidden when users want to save data, maybe images with no alt text, for instance, with empty alt attributes. Um, so that's something that, that we're also looking at doing. Um, whenever you can, prefer system fonts. System fonts require no additional downloads, which is awesome. Um, you can use font display optional to actually cause the fonts to be loaded separately. Um, which will improve uh, font loading performance. So there's there's a short blocking period, the browser will move on, um, and then that optional font will be downloaded and used the next time the page is rendered. Um, so that's really useful if you do use custom fonts to use the font display optional um, uh, property. So CSS can absolutely cause issues, but by far, JavaScript is the number one thing that can mess stuff up in terms of being able to equitably, equitably deliver our, our content. Um, so JavaScript can, can deliver great experiences or it can un undermine them. So for instance, something as simple as the let keyword, which scopes variables to the current block, um, that might work great on your machine. It works in every modern browser, but older browsers don't understand it. And when they don't understand that one simple keyword, in your JavaScript, the entire JavaScript program is thrown out. Not just that block that it's in, the entire file is just thrown out entirely because it has no idea, the browser has no idea how to interpret it. So that little teensy teensy little thing, because I chose let instead of var, now all of a sudden there's a whole host of older browsers that cannot access this content at all, if it depends on JavaScript to get there. So we need to, to keep in mind that there are all sorts of single points of failure that, that we have um, on the web, and JavaScript is a really, really big one. Now, in a uh, case study from Government Digital Services, uh, kind of on the, on the idea of JavaScript here, 1.1% um, of their total users didn't actually get a JavaScript-based enhancement. And what was particularly interesting about this study that um, that gov.uk did is that the way they set it up, they were able to determine how many people should have gotten the JavaScript enhancement, but didn't. So they, they had a couple of ways that they were, were loading images and trying to figure out who had JavaScript and who didn't. And the, so the interesting thing was that 0.9% of their user base should have gotten the JavaScript enhancement. In other words, they didn't have JavaScript turned off, but for some reason they didn't get that enhancement at all. So in total, 1.1% um, of their users, uh, which is like one in 93 people, if I remember correctly, didn't get um, the JavaScript-based enhancement. Now, the reasons that they may not have gotten that enhancement might be corporate or local blocking or stripping of, of JavaScript elements. Um, I've been in scenarios where, where that's happened. Um, maybe there were existing JavaScript errors in the browser, either from browser add-ons or toolbars or something like that. Maybe the page was left between requesting the, they used images, as I mentioned, uh, requesting the base image and the script, no script image. So that that is sort of a, a big question mark. Um, browsers sometimes preload pages and, and they may have incorrectly predicted that you would visit that page. So in that instance, the base image may have been requested, but the script ones hadn't. Um, or maybe there were network issues, especially on mobile devices. Um, and I'm sure there are undoubtedly many more uh, potential pitfalls that would cause the JavaScript not to execute uh, that I haven't even thought about. But 
all of this is to say JavaScript is not a bad thing, but we need to understand that when we're using JavaScript, we need to understand what its limitations are and plan for that. Plan for the failure case, plan for our JavaScripts not running and figure out how can we deliver the critical information and services that we're building um, in the absence of JavaScript. That way we build resilient experiences that are gonna work for people no matter what. So to kind of circle back on this, we want to empower everyone by writing clearly and concisely, making accessible markup choices, ensuring our designs can adapt, and then making sure that JavaScript and CSS uh, don't get in the way, don't undermine that experience. Um, in this next section, I wanna talk a little bit about waste. Um, so we have a lot of waste on the web. Unnecessary imagery is a big one. Um, we also want to grant users some control over um, how much we're delivering to them, how much, how much scripting, how many images, th that sort of things. So that's another way that we can eliminate waste. We can minimize our RAM footprint and we really should be doing this. Um, and we should be looking to reduce our energy consumption as well. Um, I love this, this quote from uh, Maciej Siglowski. Um, I feel like he sums this, this whole world of waste up. Um, I want to share with you my, two, my simple two-step secret to improving the performance of any, any website. One, make sure that the most important elements of the page download and render first. Two, stop there. Um, so that was from his website obesity crisis uh, talk, which is phenomenal. I definitely uh, recommend you, you take a look at that. It's, it's quite good. Um, the reality is we send a lot of cruft um, with our pages. And you know, we, we have the saying images are worth a thousand words, but that's not always the case and images aren't always the best choice. Uh, another luminary in, in kind of the web waste space, Jerry McGovern recently wrote a book about digital products contributions towards spoiling our planet. And in it, he talked about many of the issues with images on the web. Um, a list apart, which I'm the editor of, has an ex excerpt of this if you're interested, um, but I'll just read, a, read for a moment here. So the web is smothering us in useless images that create tons of pollution. These cliched stock images communicate absolutely nothing of value, interest, or use. They are one of the worst forms of digital pollution and waste as they cause page bloat, making it slower for pages to download while pumping out wholly un unnecessary pollution. They take up space on the page, forcing more useful content out of sight, making people scroll for no good reason. Now, Jerry McGovern is actually a, a UX and uh, information architecture specialist. And so he thinks a lot about these things and how people are, integrate, are, are interacting with our web pages. Um, so there are undoubtedly instances where images can be uh, very valuable, where they can draw a user's eye to um, something that's super important, especially when competition is very high uh, for that person's attention. But when we scale down, when competition is low, they become less, less useful. And in certain scenarios, they can actually cause problems, forcing weird layout bugs and um, all sorts of, of breakages to happen. So if we start to be selective about our images and honestly realistic about them as well, um, we can build a less wasteful experience. We can ask questions like, does the image reiterate information that's found in the surrounding text? If it is, or if it does, then we may not need it, right? Is, is the image necessary to understand the surrounding content? If not, maybe we don't need it. Does the image contain text? Maybe we should put that as text instead and style it with CSS. Is the image a graph, a chart, or a table? Could that information be presented um, in a different way that would not require use of an image instead? Um, and finally, is the image purely presentational? If we think about images in this way, we can make some harder choices about when we include images. And that will make the images that we do include even more impactful because there aren't gonna be as many of them competing for our attention. So getting rid of wasteful images helps us reduce the waste on our end. But as I mentioned before, we should allow users to control their own data. Um, they should control their experience, just like being able to, to dictate the size of the screen that we're dropping our content into. Now, one, browser, one way browsers are starting to enable this and to deal with the exponential growth of page weight is via the save data header. Um, now, the save data header can get sent over um, in the request and you can handle it on the server side, or you could actually handle this in your service worker. So you can capture the navigator.connection save data property um, and then respond accordingly in your service worker. So in this case, um, if I'm 
saving data, I want to respond with, respond with a fallback image. And I'll provide the URL of, of the, uh, the image into the fallback image, and I can supply the right one. So um, this is an example from my own blog where I have the, um, the, the likes and shares of an article um, captured via web mentions uh, displayed in the page, and it's got everybody's little uh, avatar, which is awesome. Um, but if somebody has saved data turned on, this is really extraneous information. It's it's not super necessary for anyone uh, to have this. It's more of a, a nice to have. So I'll swap that out for some placeholder images. And similarly, I'm using a, a pre-cached SVG for these images. Um, and I'm doing a similar thing in the comments from people, which are also done via web mentions, where I'm not loading images from those, con from those mentions, because that's extra stuff. It's not the primary purpose of the article that somebody came there to read, um, which I would render those images, but I would remove any images that are extra. So these are, are from comments that people have made on the, uh, on the article. Um, and because I've done them in SVG and pre-cached them, I'm able to make them accessible because they're SVG. So that, that content, data saver, active, media, not loaded, is actually accessible to people who use screen readers. Um, but I can also scale this to whatever dimensions the image would have been, um, which is, is pretty cool as well. Um, but that's still just part of the, the picture of, of web performance, or not web performance, but waste on the web. Another issue that we need to be concerned with is RAM. Um, RAM is, a, is an issue on devices, especially on low-end ones. Um, it's, a, it's a finite resource that we're dealing with. So if we want to build more RAM-conscious websites, we want to A, ship less code, because less code means less uh, information being loaded into RAM, um, which will improve the experience. Um, we want to restrict the use of global variables. Um, and we want to clean up things like timers and callbacks. And we want to make sure that we're careful with using things like closures. All of these improve uh, memory management because it makes sure that the JavaScript garbage collector can release memory properly. Um, and the, in particular, the problem with global variables is that by definition, they live during the whole execution of the program. So in other words, they always consume RAM, whether the program uses them or not. Um, and contrast that with local variables, they have a very short lifespan and only consume memory when the program needs them. Um, another thing just to kind of keep in mind is that if the code is quote unquote reachable, um, it's being held in memory. memory. Um, so we need to make sure that we're releasing things like DOM nodes and large objects, especially um, when we're going through and, uh, and writing our, our code. And we want to make sure that we're monitoring memory use in DevTools. DevTools can be really helpful uh, for us in determining um, how much memory we're using. Another thing I want to talk about in this uh, space is battery usage. And you know, electricity is very much a luxury. And the more code that we ship, um, the more energy we end up using on the devices that are accessing our, our content. So have you ever considered how much energy your website consumes when it's running on a device? I think we should spend more time thinking about this. And it's helpful to frame that with how long it takes to charge a smartphone, for instance. So I'm going to show a, a few examples here. So about two to three hours on the electrical grid with a diesel generator about the same, solar panels about eight to 10 hours, depending on the weather and the type of solar panels you're using. Um, you can get about 12 to 20 minutes of cell phone use for about three to 10 minutes of cranking your hand on a hand crank. Um, if you're using a bicycle crank, it's about two to three hours like the standard electrical grid. Um, and then if you're using kinetic energy about, that's, that's human movement uh, or movement of any sort, you can get about an hour for uh, an hour of, um, or you can get about an hour of usage or an hour of, of effort put in. Um, and then thermo power, so, so burning or, or heat uh, based powers in about two hours, uh, you can charge a smartphone. So um, if we want to make our sites, sites less resource hungry and create energy efficient websites, we should be shipping less code, serving properly sized images in the best format because that requires computation to, to resize images. Um, we should be optimizing and minifying all the files that we possibly can. That inclu includes both code and graphics. Um, don't do things like autoplay videos. Uh, that can really burn through, um, burn through somebody's uh, energy. And using things like system fonts, again, not requiring downloading of additional fonts that then have to be rendered, um, and delivering less JavaScript, integrating less third-party code, implementing a service worker. Are you, 
just sensing a pattern here. Um, uh, other things to think about is vector um, uh, versus raster images. So vector will generally be less memory intensive, uh, WebP versus other image formats. Um, video and JavaScript in particular are very CPU intensive, which means they use more energy. Now, the benefits of, of following this guidance is across the board for consumers, for organizations, and of course, uh, for the planet. Now, there's a fantastic project from Low Tech Magazine where they rebuilt their entire website to run on 100% solar with a battery backup on a single board computer that retails for about 40 euros. Um, it's, the article uh, that I linked to here is largely focused on server-side implementations, but the choices they make actually have a direct impact on end users as well. Um, it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting study that I, I recommend you check out. So to eliminate waste, we wanna get rid of unnecessary imagery, grant users some level of control, um, allowing them to save data, minimizing our RAM footprint and reducing our overall energy consumption. Now, finally, in the last portion here, uh, home stretch, um, we need to consider the complexity of our projects. So as a developer, I fully recognize that I have a tendency to fawn over interesting and elegant languages and frameworks. And that's sometimes led me to ignore the real impact of choosing a particular approach um, and, and what that can do to the project. And if what we're building matters, we need to make sure the decisions that we make are actually in service of that project. Complexity can be okay when it's warranted, but if we reach for a simpler, if we can reach for a simpler solution, we should. So we should, first of all, develop dependency awareness. We should reach for the right tools for the job, and we should consider going static. So Tim Berners-Lee, who creates, uh, who created the World Wide Web, um, said that the use, the least useful power, or the, sorry. Use the least powerful language suitable for expressing information constraints or programs on the World Wide Web. Um, this is gets cited often. It's the rule of least power, um, and I want to show you kind of what a what an example of this looks like in practice. So let's consider a button. Right, there are several options for creating buttons, but not all of them are created equally. There's the input of type submit. There's the button of type submit. We could do things with an anchor. Uh, or we could do it with a division. Now, any of these can work to submit a form, but only two are guaranteed to function the way they should, no matter what. The other two have dependencies that may not be met in less than ideal scenarios. So let's walk through the characteristics of each of these. So we have the input. It looks like a button. For assistive technology, it actually presents itself non-visibly as a button. It is focusable. It is activatable via keyboard, via mouse, via touch, um, and it will submit a form. The button of type submit has all of the same features, ticks all those same boxes. Now an anchor element, it actually appears as underlying text by default if you don't have CSS involved. Non-visibly, it is just a named generic, right? So it has, has the name. It is focusable via the keyboard, it kind of activates, it doesn't activate in the same way. Um, so the buttons will actually activate with mouse touch, the enter key and the space bar. An anchor does not activate with the space bar. Um, and anchors are not capable of submitting a form. A division just looks like block text. It is not exposed to assistive technology as anything. It has no semantic meaning. It is not focusable and it does not activate at all, and it doesn't submit a form. So there are some very significant um, drawbacks to using anchors and divs, because each of these requires a dependency. So we need to make, to use CSS to make them look like buttons. We need to add aria role of button in order to ex uh, expose them semantically to assistive technology as a button. We need to add a tab index of zero to the div in order to make it focusable. We need to use JavaScript uh, to handle the activation. And we need to use JavaScript to handle the form submission as well. So that's a lot of additional dependencies that we're bringing into the equation when we could get all of that stuff for free. Now, I'm sure some of you are asking, like, when is CSS unavailable? Well, there's browser support, which is something that, that we don't often consider that, that CSS is not universally supported. Um, some users actually disable CSS for performance reasons. 
Uh, maybe the user is applying a user style sheet that trumps your rules in order to, prove, uh, in order to improve accessibility uh, or for some other personal preference. Uh, maybe a networking issue caused the external CSS to be unavailable. Uh, or maybe the selector you're using is too advanced for the browser. Um, and, or the rules are contained in a media query and the browser doesn't support them or, or the query doesn't apply. In a very similar way, JavaScript is avail isn't available if the browser doesn't support JavaScript or if it's disabled by the user, if there's a networking issue, if there's a firewall that blocks it, or a browser plugin that somehow blocks the JavaScript execution, or there's some third-party JavaScript that's wreaking havoc on the page, or maybe you've got a bug, uh, or maybe the browser failed a feature detection test and exited the program early, or maybe the user is still waiting for the browser to download, parse, and execute your JavaScript program. So that's the uncanny valley uh, that I talked about earlier. And even ARIA, um, you know, ARIA can be problematic as well. Um, so if you, let's say your JavaScript fails to make the div behave like a button, but you use assistive technology um, to expose it as a button, then there's a mismatch in terms of, of the experience. Um, and also you're reliant on the browser uh, and the assistive technology combo that the user is using to access the content that they both support whatever that ARIA feature is. Um, and in fact, the first rule of ARIA is that if you can use a native HTML element or attribute with the semantics and behavior you require already built in, instead of repurposing an element and adding an ARIA role or a state or a property to make it accessible, then you should do that. So the first rule of ARIA is essentially not to use ARIA. And just as a reality check here, this was a button. Buttons are super simple. They're a very basic interface element, and yet we frequently overcomplicate them. And if we do this for buttons, you can bet we do it for more naturally complicated interfaces as well. So we should look to start simple, use what HTML gives us for free, and we don't have to worry about dependencies that are causing our products to become unusable. Um, dependency awareness, and I know we're, we're coming up on time, dependency awareness uh, extends to networking as well. Um, back in 2011, Gawker Media launched a new platform for their blogs. And what ended up happening is they were dependent on an API call. And if something blocked that API call, as actually happened when they rolled out the site, um, the site didn't load any content. And these were blogs. Thankfully, they've learned from their mistake. Uh, this is Lifehacker without JavaScript today. But we want to make sure that our critical tasks can't be undermined by a failed request. You don't want to roll the dice every time, uh, seeing whether your product will work as intended. So if we make mission critical API calls, we should do that before sending pages to the browser. Uh, there are a lot of server side ways that we can do that uh, using PHP, Ruby, Node, uh, or there, there are systems like Netlify's build functions and Cloudflare, Cloudflare's workers that'll let us do this at the edge as well, which is pretty cool. Um, and then finally, and I talked about this earlier, uh, it's easy to get caught up in the new hotness, which is totally understandable. Um, and it's a, a good thing that you're excited by new developments in the field, but we need to choose um, the right tool for the right job. It's fine to experiment and evaluate new frameworks and tools, but as an industry, we tend to spend, we don't spend enough time evaluating the appropriateness of a given technology for a project. Um, and so we should focus on the technical requirements of our project and evaluate our uh, co coding options through that lens. And we shouldn't experiment on critical projects. We don't wanna put someone's access to their bank account at risk because you see a bunch of companies using a particular framework or approach. We wanna minimize the risk to our customers and honestly, to our organization's reputation. Um, and then finally, uh, we should consider going static. So instead of making calls to the server, um, which is the traditional way, we can instead build the site statically on our own uh, computer or maybe as part of a CI CD system and then deliver that to a cloud server which can then reply with static uh, sites all the time. And then we can enhance things following the, the jam stack of JavaScript APIs and markup um, using things like GraphQL, content stack, service, uh, serverless functions, Google Maps, et cetera, to improve uh, the website as we're able to do so. So reducing complexity is about de developing dependency awareness, reaching for the right tools for the job, uh, and then finally considering going static. We wanna eliminate as many technical barriers to delivering your product or service as possible. So in summation here, let's rise to meet every moment by planning for the worst, empowering our customers, our neighbors, our constituents, eliminating waste and reducing complexity. Thank you all very much. Um, and I would very happily, I know we're at time um, and I actually need to, to run as well here. Um, but if you have questions, you can feel free to tweet at me and I would more than happily uh, answer them.
um, as soon as I'm able.